Welcome to the penultimate episode of the Mind Deck Books podcast. On this episode, you will finally learn the answer to the ultimate question. What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? What is this all about? And also, why you need a towel? I'm going to have about 42 thoughts of the day. So ecstatic to talk about this book. But don't panic, listeners. To ponder about the meaning of life, Paolo is also here. Ah, life. Don't even talk to me about life. Exactly. I hope that you enjoyed this character, because that's the essence of despair in this book. <laughs> the essence of despair. Yes. <laughs> Did you like Marvin? <laughs> If you have to say who's the connoisseur of despair, it's Marvin. It's it's your master, like uh, okay. sensei. All right. In the universe of depression. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not that deep. Into I hope so. I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, would you call this your idol? Because you're so indulgent in despair. So does he inspire you to be more depressed? Um, I I don't know. Like I think. He's more cynical, like he, yeah, his, yeah, his depression true. is more just an excuse to be cynical. He doesn't enjoy it. He yeah. just wants to be cynical. That's true. You, you're in there for the enjoyment. So yes. That's different. I apologize. I see. No. <laughs> that is fine. On this episode, we're of course talking about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, which is uh, one of my all-time favorite books. Might be even the favorite. So I'm a huge fanboy here. I'm very happy to have Paolo read it. And hopefully he's going to be here to ground us <laughs> and tell us what this book actually is like. Because I'm clearly not capable of telling you objectively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so before we get into the book, I'd like to talk a little bit about the podcast. Just a quick update, because this might actually be a short episode. It's a pretty short book. Mm. And I'm going to try not to rave too much about it mm. and be brief. So we've uh, finished, we have survived the Free Body Problem trilogy or Remembrance of Earth Past. We've also survived the Broken Earth trilogy recently, <laughs> which is a little bit of a of an undertaking. Mm. Does it feel like hard work to read the Broken Earth trilogy? It, it wasn't hard reading it at all. I think it was fairly easy. I think it's among the books we talked about so far on the podcast. It's the book that left me with more to think about mm -hmm. for good and for bad. Uh, yeah. Like the, the Broken Earth trilogy really, like, I still think about it sometimes. And That's true. Yeah. That's true. I've also gotten a bunch of messages from people and uh, one guy said that... Uh, yeah, most Many people sent me a message that they really enjoyed reliving the Remembrance of the Earth Past trilogy because they want to refresh. Like It's a, it's a nice way to remember... The, the ideas from the book so I think we succeeded with that on the podcast it's a good remembrance yes <laughs> literally <laughs> and uh, I looked at some of the statistics and like the demographics and all these like numbers from the podcast and when I did the Mind Like Japan podcast about 60% of listeners were women guess mm -hmm. how many percent of women is our book podcast I mean I do know more women readers than men readers but me too yes uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but for this podcast, I would say it's 5%. Yeah, you're right. It's like 10%. <laughs> okay. And no women on this podcast. So. Okay. I'm sorry, ladies. I guess this is not for you. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, an interesting statistic is that the third book of the Remembrance of the Rough Past trilogy, The mm. Death's End, got about 10 times more listens than any other episode we've ever done on any podcast. Mm. It's like super popular. I don't know why people listen to that. <laughs> Uh, if like, why do you want to listen to the third book in our four episode series? Like, wh why is it? <laughs> I guess it just got recommended. I, I don't know. It's strange. So yeah. anyway, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to talk a little bit about the future plans and what uh, other episodes and books are coming up to hopefully bring in some women on this uh, man forsaken Wiener party. Just uh, to have a woman. Uh, of course, Chen has to join us. She's been on many other podcasts. 
So we're bringing Chen back to talk about uh, Dead Witch Walking by Kim Harrison, which is like an urban fantasy crime story. It's pretty good. I already read it. So that's coming up, hopefully. More of a feminine take on fantasy. However, the, the Broken Earth was very feminine, but I guess it's for men to read. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. You also bring back uh, Paul to talk about the Starship Troopers book by Robert Heinlein, which I'm very excited to talk about. Uh, Martin and Adam from some of the other podcasts are going to join me to talk about the Hail Mary project, or just Hail Mary, I'm not sure what's the name, by Andy Weir. It's like a new sci-fi book for, by the guy who wrote The Martian. Mm. That's also the movie. That's also Yas from the Mental Japan podcast who read The Foundation with me, which we both disliked. <laughs> <laughs> and finally... <laughs> Interesting, you both disliked it. <laughs> I thought he was really passionate about it. Yeah, I was really excited to read The Foundation and then... Yeah, I think it's the book I liked the least from all the books we've read on this podcast so far. Mm. And I'm sure it's not going to be as hated as The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, <laughs> which I'm going to discuss with Brad on one of the episodes. <laughs> I've, tra- I've been trying to get Brad on this podcast, but we are the most different people when it comes to literature. We never read the same shit. <laughs> so hopefully it's going to be an interesting discussion. The book is pretty short. It's really famous. Mm. So I'm going to put myself through this. I'll survive it, and hopefully something interesting is going to come out of it. <laughs> I'm really curious to hear what you two will think about uh, The Prince. Yeah, me too. This, this is one of the reasons I, I've started this podcast, is to make me read stuff that I would never read. Because, you know, there is comfort books, there is mm-hmm. enjoyable thought-provoking books, but then there is also, like, books you should know about, but you don't want to. Like, I feel like it's nice to have a thing to open your mind. Is the prince one of them? <laughs> yeah, I feel like. Okay. Like, Brad also read The 48 Rules of Power. I don't know the gay guy's name. Ah, uh, really yeah, famous yeah, yeah. Thing. That, But that's a new one, I think. That's, that's a, a new one. one. Yeah. yeah. R- relatively new. Like, it's a, it's a modern book. Uh, mm-hmm. Machiavelli is from the 16th century, so. Yeah, this, this is like a super classic, like... I am curious, and because it's just 120 pages or something, I'm willing yeah. to give it a go. So I'll endure it. I'm already dreading it, but I'll do it. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> so Pablo's also reading some new stuff, which we're considering for the future episodes. He's been shocked that I don't know what this is. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> well, I, I haven't started yet. Uh, right now, I'm reading uh, the third book in the uh, Dragonlance Chronicles. Uh, in uh, our first catch-up uh, episode, I mentioned mm-hmm. I was reading... I had read the first book, which was Dragon Solo Tome T- Twilight. I've read the second, and now I'm reading the third, which is the spring one. So the second one is the winter one. Mm. Also, I'm waiting to receive two uh, Japanese literature books. Uh, one mm-hmm. is the... Well, it's considered maybe the first novel ever written, but it's definitely one of the most famous, if not the most famous piece of Japanese ancient literature, which is called uh, The Tale of Genji. Okay. Japanese ancient literature sounds very off-putting <laughs> to me, but okay. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Uh, in Japanese, it's called Genji Monogatari. Mm-hmm. And um, it's the story of the life of this uh, Genji. Okay. And uh, it was written by, by this woman during the... Heian period in Japan, so it's written, well, we don't know exactly when, but it, it should be uh, in the early 11th century. It's super old. It might be the oldest thing I would ever read if I actually read this. But the, the other book I'm reading is um, Snow Country, uh, also called in Japanese Yukiguni, hmm. by Yasunari Kawabata. I don't know too much about this book, but um, Kawabata is one of the two or three um, Japanese writers who won the a uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. Hmm. I don't know, it's just like a Japanese literature classic, and hmm. I've read several of those until now, okay. and uh, I've liked all of them. So all right. This one I'm willing to give a go, because it's only 170 pages. Yeah, this is really short. It's more recent, and it's uh, it's a name I've heard of, so yep. yeah. <laughs> so we might do this one. I think that's a good good idea. We should we could come back to Japan. All right. Uh, also, one more thing we're planning is the Hellbound Heart. It's like the Hellraiser story. Sometime it's very short. So <laughs> it's sometime. on my phone. I have to read yeah, it. Sometimes some when part. I force Paolo to read it on the phone, we, we're gonna have to talk about the ten Hellraiser movies I've seen. So that's that's coming up sometime. <laughs> just just as my therapy session. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, so that's about the update. I'm happy that we're still pushing through. Uh, coming up in the far future on episode 50, we're gonna do Dune. <laughs> There <laughs> will be episode 50. It should be I earlier. Am, like episode, I, am, I don't know, 25 yeah. or something. We've talked about this in, in the car, and I think if we keep this up, in about a year and a half or two years, that's going to be the second part of the June movie. And uh, ah, if we hit this at the same time, I think that would be the best. And I think at the same time, we would like see if this actually is going to keep going, because now mm-hmm. we're up to episode like 20 or something. Mm-hmm. Like so far, I mean, all the plans. Okay. I feel like we should be experienced enough to tackle Dune for the <laughs> like from episode 50 to episode 100 it's gonna be just Dune yeah I will have <laughs> forgotten everything <laughs> and uh, uh, episode 100 is going to be the journey to the end of the night where I'm going to officially commit suicide after I read it or something let's say 75 <laughs> we'll see we'll see episode 100 can be brother Karamazov oh my god <laughs> <laughs> So to come back uh, full circle from the avalanche of references at the beginning of this episode, Mm -hmm. uh, let's start talking about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And to start, speaking of references, can you jam and cram a Dune reference in this? I am very curious. Have you found a Dune reference? Dune reference. (laughs) This is a challenge. Like, you don't have to say now, but while we're talking, if you can find one, you're the the man, because I don't think it's possible. All right. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I have reread it partially. I really wanted to reread this. I've read this at least four times already. And mm-hmm. this is a book that's uh, very close to my heart. I love this so much. It's got all the things I want from sci-fi. Uh, it's funny. It's clever. It's easy to read. It's like got something to say. And at the same time, it's not preachy. And it's like a delightfully quirky way to point out real life issues while having like a sci-fi story. So I, I love this too much. So what do you think? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, just in general to start with. Uh, all right. So how do I put this in a way that is not too You can offensive? be blunt. I don't mind it. Be offensive. Um, That's why we're here. <laughs> so I don't want to say that I didn't like it. I, I, I liked it. I think it was interesting enough to read it without issues and to get through it. Also, I mean, it's not that long. So I have a few, not really complaints, but a few reasons why I think I couldn't appreciate it as much as mm-hmm. as you or as other people. Um, I'll talk more about those maybe as we start discussing the story and everything. But okay. I would say the biggest one is, which is kind of unfortunate, but it's also inevitable, is it's one of those books I always heard people talking about. Mm-hmm. And I've heard these jokes and these yeah, references. Kind of ruined. <laughs> yeah, like a million times, literally a million times. So when I would stumble upon it, uh, upon them, I would just be, oh, okay, so that's what this was about hmm. uh, it's not interesting anymore <laughs> that makes complete sense when i first yeah. read it i knew nothing i was so young like I, yeah. I, I was exposed like without any like internet didn't exist at the time i read this right. like <laughs> yeah and, and besides that the other thing for me is like aside from like knowing already the jokes and and the references and everything else part of it is like the expectations which, I mean, mm-hmm. that comes also with our books. Like, for example, for Dune, I had super, super, super high expectations. Mm-hmm. But for Dune, I, I knew basically nothing about... Uh, I knew about there were worms and spies, mm-hmm. and that was pretty much it. I, I want to say else. with Dune that somehow magically worked, even though I knew the story, basically, it still worked. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that's possible. Yeah, in my I, case, I knew a lot about Dune before I... I, I, I knew basically nothing, but I had super high expectations, and they were completely fulfilled. So I don't want to say that in this case... I had really high expectations and they were not fulfilled. Like, what I would say is just that hearing so much about it, so much about the jokes, so many references, seeing it everywhere for Mm -hmm. all my life, just kind of spoiled it for me. But exactly, it it just kind of made it less appealing. Yeah, that's completely, completely understandable. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's that's too bad. But uh, maybe to give you some motivation if you continue because this series is uh, six books uh, mm. basically five books it's like a one short story so people keep joking about the first book and I don't mm. think anybody bothered to read the rest of the series yes I think so so if you want like a bunch more of this but not be spoiled there is plenty more and <laughs> I don't think the the quality goes down at all mm. and it's kind of strange because I have the same feeling when I uh, reread it 
Uh, I think the whole series I read definitely twice, maybe three times, like halfway through. And I always forget what happens. I'm always so excited. I always like, oh, this is so funny. But I, <laughs> it okay. like somehow f- doesn't stay. Like some, I always find some jokes I, I missed or forgot. Mm. So that's another reason why I like to like this so much because it somehow makes me smile and like laugh so much even though I read it. So it's it's like somehow works even though I, I know it. <laughs> mm. And I agree that the first book might be my least favorite from the same reason because it's so much drilled in your head that you already know everything yes and uh i was really tempted after i finished the first book to go ahead and buy the second book which shows that i mean i, I liked it but also decided against it just because i will talk more about this in the sorry discussing mm-hmm, yeah. more like the other details but it's just not the style of book i i enjoy reading as much like this style, I much rather read a comic than a book. Okay. Yeah. If you're a person who's in the same shoes as Paolo and you've read all mm-hmm. this and seen all this and know all this and you don't really want to read it because it's going to be the same direction, I would very, very highly recommend watching the 1981 British TV show that's got mm-hmm. only six episodes. And each episode, I think, is just 20 minutes. So it's basically mm-hmm. like a movie. And it's got all the book, all the first book. And it's amazing. Mm-hmm. I love it because it's even won uh, three BAFTA awards. And it's they have like excerpts from the book and they give you out like the ideas. And the costumes are so jank. It's it's amazingly like really charming because like like Zafod Beeblebrox, one of the characters, has two heads. And in this in this show, he looks amazing. <laughs> it's okay. so bad, but it's so amazing. And all these like props from like 1980s, and mm-hmm. the acting is kind of. Bad, but in a very jovial way, I, I, I would really recommend it. If you don't want to read this, it's the same thing. Like, if you've read it and you're like a big fan, please watch it. But if you've read it and you don't care, there's no point in watching it because it's the same thing. It's okay. very, very faithful. Uh, it's also a movie from 2005, which I also liked. This movie is different in many, many ways. And I think it's on purpose because this story, like you just said, is so famous. And they played their own spin on it so it starts the same way and then they go to a differently completely different place and they like borrow stuff from the book but they do a different retelling of the story so there are so many fresh things that you don't know Mm. and it makes it more interesting i think they did that because yeah people they know this story too well now so they just wanted to make it a little bit fresh Mm. and uh it's not as good as the book but it's fun so if you like sci-fi comedy it's it's a good movie if you want the most faithful adaptation of this book that's not what it is okay. it's got some new funny ideas that were not in the books which i appreciate and the effects are fun mm. i mean i i've thought about because you mentioned before the 80s series and mm-hmm. uh, i really thought about about actually reading that <laughs> reading about watching <laughs> it reading uh, is just in my infinite pile of, of things i want to watch so and you eat dinner just just watch like it's i think you can even find it on youtube it's so old just mm. for, watch like a clip and you, you'll know exactly what you're getting into. So you either <laughs> like it or you're not. It's very simple to tell. <laughs> Just watch like the intro like video spot. It's hilarious already. So <laughs> if you like that, instantly watch it. If you if you put off by the style, just don't bother. <laughs> All right. Makes sense. So as usual, I'd like to mention the, the writer. Uh, this is one of my favorite writers of all time, Douglas Adams. Mm. I love him so much for so many reasons. He's got a really, really good way of making people laugh and telling them what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like telling people they're wrong and changing their ways is impossible. And it's like an inhuman feat at times. And he somehow manages to describe everyday issues without making you mad and telling you that you're wrong without (laughs) making you like upset. Or just commenting on like society mm-hmm. and life, like uh, he always jokes about uh, faucets and sinks and mm-hmm. uh, toilets. That's that's where I got this from. You might have seen my video how I can't flush a toilet in Japan. And he <laughs> talks about how people keep reinventing things that don't have to be reinvented. In the book, they mention that people have uh, digital watches now and they have reinvented nice. the analog clock after it being perfectly fine, functional, easy to understand, and easy to see. But now. People can't even read an old clock sometimes, myself included, I have to admit. <laughs> and there's no point. And it's like, what? And then you go to an airport and there's like a faucet and you like turn it, turn it right, you turn it up. Do you, do you hit it with your fist? Do you knee it? Do you step on it with your foot? And then finally it like 
pour its water on your chest and you, you're just like, what is this? Why don't they just have the same faucet? It's, it's so stupid. Yeah, he has definitely like a very distinctive style and um, it works really, really well. He's very clever. And not only about sci-fi, he's written a book called The Last Chance to See. And it's about uh, animals that are about to go extinct. And it's so bittersweet, I can't deal. It's like the most saddest and funniest thing ever. Okay. That is a lecture he gave uh, in a university. And uh, you can watch it on YouTube for free. It's called Last Chance to See Perots, the Universe and Everything. And uh, it's about, I think, five species that are strangely unable to survive because of the outside influence. The mm. best example is the Kakapo Perot, which is a fat bird that uh, didn't have any natural uh, predators and got so fat it lost the ability to fly but didn't lose the will to fly so it perpetually like okay. runs at the cliff and jumps off the cliff and tries to fly and dies because the evolution somehow made him so fat quicker than learning that he shouldn't be flying and at the same <laughs> time the birds are like uh, impossibly to, to mate or breed because when the male is trying to find a female he makes a humming sound that's very low low pitch, mm -hmm. which if you have a deep sound, you cannot tell where it's coming from. So the oh, female okay. can never find him. And when she finally finds him, she will mate him only if some kind of a stupid tree is in bloom. And then if yeah, it's, it's, it's insane. So they never have children anymore. There's like 100 <laughs> kakapo perots in the world. <laughs> he talks about this kind of stuff. And he always had a way to like say something. So he obviously talks about people, how the same thing is happening to people. Mating the human relationships and dating has been becoming exponentially more complex until we basically don't have more than one child and usually it's such a struggle to even have a child it's basically the same problem like this parrot so <laughs> so that's why i like him he always has this like way to flip it around and tell you something with this message it sounds pretty interesting so if you're into animals if you're into comedy if you're into like learning something i highly highly recommend just go on youtube and search the Perot, the universe and everything, Douglas Adams, and you can watch the whole talk. It's about one hour or one hour and a half. It's delightfully funny and concerning and emotionally like scary. It's 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 all the things <laughs> I, I like. <laughs> okay. Everything I like. Fear, yeah. depression. <laughs> no, I I mean it more the comedy. He he's very funny. He should do stand up comedy. He never did that, but I think he would be he would be brilliant. Which he basically did stand up comedy, but he he told like a biology mm. lesson while doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm already talking too much, but just one last thing to mention. Have you heard of the uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency? I I remember hearing about it, but I have I know absolutely nothing. This is a series about a detective who solves uh, mysteries by using holistic techniques. Which, if you don't know, holistic means that everything is connected. So it's basically insanity. He's like, this spoon has touched my face two weeks ago. And that means that two weeks ago there was seven o'clock. And at seven o'clock there are also spoons. So this shop had to sell spoons at seven o'clock. That's where the murder happened. Let's go. <laughs> it's like, okay. it's, so that's like holistic means just any, everything is connected. You can always find a connection to everything. And it's it's another like comedy nonsense story. All right. Uh, they filmed it into a TV show on Netflix. There are two seasons. First one's pretty good. The second one's kind of meh but uh, maybe that, that's where I, where I heard yeah. about it so that's uh, the second most famous thing it's mm -hmm. not as good as the hijackers but I still like it a lot okay so, so I've been raving a lot so let's let's <laughs> try to move forward <laughs> so I, I'll I'll give you like a thing I like I guess and you say mm -hmm. just something you like or dislike so I can okay. have you talk more for example I like the names in this book Slarty Bardfast Zephod Beeblebrox the Pengalactic pen Gargle Blaster I love the names Ah, uh, <laughs> I didn't. Okay. But, uh, okay, I guess this con kind of connects to what I want to say. I can understand, like, the, like these names, they all have a certain style, they all have a certain uh, flavor to it, and it's easy to identify. Hmm. And I think it works pretty well, mm -hmm. in a way. On the other hand, though, it, it's just not the style of things I like. <laughs> okay. It's super silly. Like, it's goofiness yeah. to, to the end. Yeah, level. yeah. I like certain silliness. I think I kind of lost the appreciation for that kind of silliness. Or okay. it kind of deviated a little bit. So, okay, connected to what I wanted to say. So, let me ask you a question first. Do okay. you like Monty Python? Love it, of course. 
<laughs> yes. Like, this book reminded me so much, the style of comedy, it reminded me so much of Monty Python. It is, yes. For me, the thing with Monty Python is, if I watch a sketch, like a five-minute sketch of Monty Python, mm-hmm. I would say four times out of five, I'll find it hilarious okay. and just really, really like it. But if you ask me to watch, like, a Monty Python movie, hmm. I, I just can't do it. Like, I would get <laughs> so bored because... Like, this style just doesn't catch me so much. Like, okay. uh, after so little, I get bored. I understand. And, yeah. yeah. So, this was one of my main uh, thing with this with this book, is that, like, I could see and think, like, oh, it's written really well. The style is great. Uh, the jokes are on point and everything. But it just doesn't, doesn't hit me. Yeah. Maybe this is not the reason why I liked it so much uh, and why this worked for me as a person who started reading and didn't really like reading or like I, I never liked. I, I don't read much. Like I started reading a lot now but and I always liked reading but I never read much. And this book I read like, you know, like a little bit and then I forgot and then I came back to it. I liked a little bit and it worked perfectly in the sense it's like a sketch. So maybe that's right. why I liked it so much, because I didn't like read it in one go. I was just like having a joke and then have a break. Yeah, as I mentioned maybe in, in some other episode, I, I usually don't like short stories because I like just getting through the book. Yeah. I like like the the horizontal mm-hmm. yeah, the plot like, line. Uh, you know, development of the story. Yeah. And so in this book, like getting through it, it was not a struggle or anything. It's just that I could see that after reading like three jokes, I was like, yeah, please stop. (laughs) This is is enough. It's it's kind of like, you know, when you eat some food that it's really good and you like it and then you reach a certain point and you're like, I just, I just want something different. Not because it's not good. It's still good. It's just, yeah, I absolutely understand what you're saying. This is definitely a completely different style of reading reading than any book we've ever talked about on this podcast. Yeah. This is not really like a book you write. It's it's the story. Mm-hmm. If you miss part of it, it doesn't matter. You're you're like more into this like quirky comedy sketch like accidental philosophy thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which I love this because, you know, if you listen to my Japan podcast, the, the thought of the day, like mm-hmm. thinking about nonsense and overthinking shit, that's <laughs> this book. And I love that you can have an overthinking moment that's solved and saying something and it's funny. So that's why I love it. Because yeah, yeah. to give you an example, one of the quotes mm-hmm. I constantly quote in my daily life and I love from this first book was that one of the main characters is uh, not a human and he is mesmerized why people keep to- too much and why people keep stating the obvious. And he's like, why do people just not shut up? Why do they say the same shit all the time? Why do they always say like what they are seeing and it's right in front of them? This doesn't make any sense. And then he's like, oh yeah, I have a hypothesis. It's because their lips would seize up if they didn't open their mouth enough and practice their vocal cords, they would atrophy. And I think this is uh, so, like so true because we just say so much crap that has no mm. reason to be said. <laughs> so here's the answer. People talk about nothing because if they didn't, their mouth would just <laughs> seize up. Yeah, yeah. I like like I like some of these reflections. I like some of these ideas, but then a few of the other things they just don't don't hit me so much. And another one, another thing I want to say, I guess, is maybe I read this book at the wrong time in my life. Like I <laughs> I had so many times when I was reading it when I was thinking, you know, five years ago, like when I was like in university or whatever, like this would have been really funny. That's true. It's more of a younger crowd book. Yeah, some of, I, I want to say also, in a way, I know it's not edgy, but in a way, it's also edgy. It is. Uh, what, what, yes. I, what I want, what I mean to say is this. So, of course, clearly, like it's not edgy in the way, like you know, dark and hmm. uh, complaining and whining and and so on. But as you said, like it makes a lot of jokes about certain aspects of you know humanity and and people and mm-hmm. civilization and so on. But mm-hmm. they're kind of edgy. If you think about yeah, it, that's true. I think I, I'm just past that phase. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, which again, it's not the book's fault. That's true. We are old yeah. men now. There is no joy uh, in our yeah, lives. Yeah, I'm definitely can't really that. old. <laughs> <laughs> which I am a bunch older than Paolo, by the way. So I, uh, uh, what I want to say, uh, already dementia hitting me. 
uh, yeah, so when I read it, I think it's more nostalgia for me. Like, uh, this is okay. my comfort place. I, I, I have to admit that when I reread parts of it, I was having fun more of like reminiscing about my favorite thing than actually mm. thinking about how much I like this. So maybe for like people who would read it now, who are a little older, they wouldn't have as much fun with it. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that. I do want to say a few other things about kind of like associations for me. For some reasons, I strongly associate this book with my father. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Not only because I know he read it and it, he was the one who told me a few of the jokes. Same. But also because, um, so this is a book from his generation. Like my father was born in 1950, so he was... Hmm like in his 20s when this book came out and uh my father was a hitchhiker like he he traveled across europe mm. i i heard so many stories from him <laughs> that's cool so i just couldn't help but think about like those stories and uh, those experiences when i was reading the book which in a way was kind of heartwarming for me mm -hmm. like of course me and my father grew up like in completely different contexts and yes. periods and so on so yeah, it was nice to to see something that you know kind of gave me Kind of some perspective on on his young days. This is the only uh, one of the only few things that I will ever have a normal and agreeable conversation with my father about. Okay. I have many father issues, and we don't understand each other. We don't talk at all. And this book, we, we agree with. So you're absolutely right. The same with me. Right. A different generation book. One more thing I want to say okay. uh, and ask you before we move on to the story and the spoilers is that mm -hmm. in the Czech Republic we have a like a huge following of this book. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because I'm biased and it's the people I like that like this or if it's actually most people but I think mm -hmm. I, I would dare to say that most Czech people know this and like this. It's like a, it's like a cultural thing and we, we have like events and there's like the Tavol Day and we have like recitals mm -hmm. of Vogan poetry at times and shit like that. Uh, so that's another reason why I like this so much because it was always around me. Mm. And uh, two weeks after uh, Douglas Adams died, they started the towel day, and it's a celebration to remember the story and the books. And you're supposed to carry around a towel all day. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for years. <laughs> is that a thing in Japan? Is in Japan in Italy? Um, it is. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, I actually like I didn't know, but I remember some of my friends were like, "Ah, oh, today is towel day." Like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> 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 well, what's that supposed to be? I think that most people, like if you stop like a random person on the street, they might have heard about the book, but they probably haven't hmm. read it. I feel like teachers and nerds and gamers know this. Yeah, I, I would say this. I would say people who are usually even uh, just a little into sci-fi usually have read this. Like mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends, even friends who usually are not big readers, who have read this. We, we even have a bar in Prague where they advertise and sell the Pan Galactic Gargle Blaster drink. Oh, okay. So you can even get that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how famous it gets. It's a, it's a phenomena, definitely. And uh, I know I said that the, in the first episode of this podcast that we're not going to do like famous books, but here we are. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> but anyway, if you want to read this, uh, I don't have to tell you that you should, but would you recommend this to people? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, even just to know what it is about. Mm. Something I could never understand is, uh, you mentioned how pe like um, at the very beginning of the episode you said, I wouldn't really know how to tell what this book is about. And I had the same experience when like some of my friends wanted to recommend it to me and every time mm -hmm. I would ask, okay, what it is about? And they were like, I just read it. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's hard to explain. Because like, it's, you said it, it's not about anything. It's just a bunch <laughs> of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But at the same time, I, I, after reading it, I don't know, maybe I'm just being super arrogant, but I feel like I, <laughs> I can explain what it is about. Okay, uh, that's what you're going to do in a few seconds. But uh, yeah. I feel like if you start explaining the plot, uh, it's too complicated and nonsensical, and you're like, okay, blah, 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 happened, blah, blah, happened, and you get into this, like, nonsense of yeah. uh, plot line, which is not the point, and then you can keep talking about the moments or the characters, which, again, takes forever, or you can talk about these ideas you like, which takes forever, so, like, you can't explain this in a short way, so that's why okay. they keep telling you to read this. I think that's why. All right. All okay. Right. Okay, so the, 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 let's do this. Okay, yeah, so I'll just say, if you're reading this, stop mm -hmm. listening, hit the stop button, and let's yes. move on to spoilers. Let's have a challenge. Okay. Okay. I'll try to explain as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Imagining like you're a person who doesn't know... I don't want to say doesn't know anything, but like has never read the book. Okay. I'll try to explain as much as I can in two minutes. Okay. And you can tell me if it's a good explanation or not. Okay. <laughs> if it's sufficient or, or... Okay, I'll start the timer. So whenever you're ready. Okay. 
So, this book is about a human who survives the destruction of Earth for futile reasons and ends up uh, hitchhiking together with uh, an alien who was pretending to be a human uh, and travels across the galaxy and survives all sorts of perils to reach a mysterious planet where uh, one of the biggest secrets in the universe is hidden. Uh, Most of the characters are pretty vain and not not too serious. The main character himself is kind of a cynical British man and uh, who doesn't even have that strong of a reaction to the destruction of Earth, if not for something like the loss of all McDonald's uh, in the universe. <laughs> and uh, it comes across all sorts of uh, weird alien things, uh, which are sort of parodies of uh, human society and human civilization. The other characters who are not humans also provide some sort of external perspective on, on humans and uh, some things which would actually look strange if you try to put yourself out of the, of the human experience. Okay. Yeah, one minute and a half. Okay. <laughs> you've done it, but you've done it, you know, in a dry way that is not the point of the book. So <laughs> it's what I said. It's like, okay, okay we know yes. the story now, but yeah. the charm and the reason the story is, is completely missed, like, a bit that's of the So that's why they don't want you to tell it. They don't, <laughs> I think if you told this to somebody, they will be like, okay, but I don't care. And, yeah, uh, possibly. Or they might get, like, the wrong... Uh wrong idea i uh, talk to people about this a lot and they always ask me the same question to tell them and i always tell them let me tell you how the book starts or how some mm-hmm. chapter starts i don't remember in one of the chapters it says in the beginning the universe was created it made a lot of people angry and it has been widely regarded as a very bad move if you think this is funny <laughs> you should read it <laughs> that's what i say always fair enough so that's like i told you nothing but this is the humor you get like if you agree with this statement mm-hmm. that people are unnecessarily angry and unhappy all of the time and people hate the creation of the universe because it's just caused them depression and problems that's uh, <laughs> that's the kind of mindset you have to be in to read this book <laughs> okay that is that's a very good way actually to to get people into it uh, just, yeah, which you know. I, I get it. You, you summed it up. I wouldn't be able to sum it up because I get so caught up in the details. I cannot like <laughs> let it go. <laughs> yeah, I guess your method works much better. No, it's it's not a method. It's just me giving up to answer the question because <laughs> I, <laughs> I know I don't want to. I don't want to do it. So, so I guess I'll just sum up the plot as usual, and we'll stop at mm-hmm. our some of my favorite or your favorite moments, and I'll try to not go too much into detail. Uh, because mm-hmm. there's not really a point like to uh, explain the jokes because either you will read that and have it amuse you or if I explain the joke it's just gonna li- ruin the joke so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think there's no point but I definitely want to just mention like the tropes and all these like mm-hmm. why people like you know why a towel and what's the 42 about and all this shit because if you mm-hmm. if you don't want to read this this is your answer to this pop culture clusterfuck mm-hmm. <laughs> So it starts with Arthur Dent, who's a disgruntled British man. I very much imagine our co-worker, who we shall not name. Ah, okay. (laughs) I think I know you. (laughs) And he he gets up and he's like, brushing his teeth, being half dead in the morning. He's like, "Mm, yellow, what is this yellow? Mm," And he leaves and he's like, what is, what? why am I thinking of what? Mm, Okay, coffee. And then he looks out the window, he's like, oh, yellow excavators, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and he, he runs out yelling at the, at the uh, like construction company and they're about to demolish his house because they're going to build a highway there. And they're upset mm-hmm. that he doesn't know because he should have checked some papers on some office somewhere. Uh, in the middle of this, a uh, random guy comes in. It's called his, his name is Ford Prefect. Yeah. This guy is like, okay, just forgot your house, let's go drink. And everybody's confused. And to sum this up in short, the Earth is shortly destroyed to build an intergalactic highway, the same way they would destroy his house. And this guy who came is an alien who was writing an entry about Earth. So he was studying Earth and he was trying to describe it in this book that's a bestseller in the galaxy, in the universe. It's called Mm -hmm. The Hijiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And that's where he has to write an entry about Earth and people. I'm going to do like a, like a quiz. What did he write there? <laughs> uh, I wrote something super short mm-hmm. like about Earth. He wrote two words. I forgot. He wrote mostly harmless. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Which is a very good way to describe Earth. <laughs> <laughs> is it? I, I guess to the universe, yes. 
Yeah, to the universe, exactly. So if you're somebody who doesn't know anything about Earth and you're like traveling in between stars, I think this is what you should know. I think that works. <laughs> okay. So uh, he's got this like technology, something gadget thing, and uh, he manages to hitch a ride on a spaceship and get Arthur to go with him. And they end up on this mm. ship that's a part of the fleet that destroys planets to make way of this for this intergalactic highway. And uh, on this ship, they have my favorite moment from maybe all of this book. What, what do you think it is? Oh, is it the poetry? No. So the poetry is that the alien race of people are so bad at poetry that they use it to torture people. But that's not my favorite point. Is it the fish? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I hate in sci-fi stories how people constantly speak English and nobody explains it. Fair enough. And all I am asking for, all I ask for is an explanation. I don't care what kind of explanation okay. it is. I want an explanation. And he literally makes fun of this point in this exact moment. And they're like, what language are I speaking? What the fuck am I supposed to do with this language? And they're like, oh, put this fish in your ear. It's the Babel fish and it's going to translate everything conveniently. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is bullshit. And the book immediately says, oh, you think this is bullshit? Many people thought so too. And they argued that this is proving that God exists because God created this thing. <laughs> and then it goes on. And I went to read this. This is probably my favorite part. And it says, mm -hmm. okay, so the argument goes something like this. I refuse to prove that I exist, says God, for proof denies faith. And without faith, I am nothing. But, says man, the Babel fish is a dead giveaway, isn't it? It could not have evolved by chance. It proves that you exist. And so, therefore, by your own argument, you don't. And God says, oh dear, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> and he vanishes in a puff of logic. <laughs> I was like, thank you. I was like, thank you. I was reading this book and I was like, not only have you answered my wishes for all five five stories, but you have wrapped it up in a nonsensical joke about God and how much it doesn't make sense. I love it. It's like everything I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, if you, if you put it that way, yeah, it, it is. It is one of the best points. I, I, this is everything I wanted in sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you should uh, take over for a bit because this is gonna go on if I just gonna keep talking about this. Stuff. <laughs> so. but yeah. Anyway, so they not even hitchhiking on this ship like in the spaceship they are kind of just hiding there and then you know they got found out and uh, they got thrown away um, like out of the ship yeah there's a funny scene where God tries to throw them out and they try to talk him out of it by having him have an existential crisis which is yeah. another one of my favorite moments but I'll I'll stop talking. That one, I don't know. I feel like it was a little too drugged but that was like one of those moments where I felt like ah <laughs> Okay. And uh, yeah, then they end up on this uh, this ship, which is using a special engine, which is the improbability engine or something. Yeah, yeah. Like that. yeah essentially, it can do things that, which are impossible, which is why they they get caught in the ship because like the chance was like one in a gazillion. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So there's another plot line with this Zafod Beeblebrook guy, who is the president of the galaxy, and he stole a ship that's got the improbability drive, and he just flies by at the same time, which is so improbable that they got caught on the ship while they got, got thrown out of the airlock to, to be killed. Yes. And uh, within 30 seconds, because it says that you would die within 30 seconds. Hmm. And I don't know if that's yeah, true, that's what happens. to be honest. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, they are on the ship. And uh, by the way, they got caught also because there was a, some stupid things about like a phone number and <laughs> woman who was yeah. on the ship. I, like there was one of those things where I, I was like, you don't need to like make it so complicated like it's not funny i was trying to play up the and, improbability like, yeah anyway they got they got on ship and uh they are going to this lost planet who was like the it used to be the richest planet uh in the universe mm -hmm. because they had the ability to manufacture planets for rich people mm -hmm. uh, until people got mad at them and essentially they rioted them. the planet was abandoned so before they get to the planet i have to mention uh, the doors, so they get they go on this ship, and mm -hmm. it's like a super special modern high technology ship. There's called the improbability drive, and there is Safford Beeblebrox, the president, and he chatted up a random girl from Earth whose her name is Trillian, who also Arthur met at some point, and she was like, "What the fuck are you doing here?" And she was like, "Why?" Am yeah, I here? yeah, that, that's like the phone number thing. Yeah, which, yeah. Uh, so basically, all this improbability. Sense 
it's like all this went together because it's so impossible to happen. Mm-hmm. That's what the improbability drive causes. They also transform into penguins and they, they make a bunch of crap appear. But anyway, on this mm-hmm. ship there is a bunch of technology, uh, which I love. Uh, one of them is the uh, robot we talked about at the beginning, uh, Marvin. Yes. <laughs> Why did you like him? I don't like him so much. Okay. <laughs> He's one of my favorite characters. I, Maybe because of the sequels. I don't know. It's kind of like the the Griffin humor. Griffin humor? Where like it's... Griffin like, like is... Uh, family Guy? Or? Like Family oh, okay. Guy. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think yeah, about I it. Always, yeah, I always call it Griffin because in Italy they, they didn't call it Family Guy. It's called just the Griffins. Oh. Right? Because it's like The Simpsons. Interesting. Anyway. It's like the Family Guy humor where it's so much in your face and so much extreme and exaggerated where like, it's just, I just don't care about it anymore. I didn't make the connection at all, to be honest. I feel like Family Guy is more uh, like dirty, like up from... Yeah, Family Guy, yeah, yeah. No, of course, like it is It is different, like it's not... But the bluntness, you're right, yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, just to, just to say what this is. So the robot is like a super intelligent artificial intelligence that is an assistant and can do a bunch of tasks around the ship and uh, it's like a crew member. But the problem is that he's got too much time to think and he can think too quickly and he knows too much. So long story short, he finds out that there is no meaning to anything and he just wants to die. And if you talk to him about life, he's like, life, don't even talk to me about life. Oh my God, just get away. Can't can't yeah. even live. This is so much shit. It's nothing makes sense. And he he leads them from like the airlock to the to the bridge of the ship, and they pass mm-hmm. through these doors. <laughs> and I love the interaction with the doors uh, and, and the robot. <laughs> it always makes me laugh. Yeah, because the doors are like super kind and mm-hmm. optimistic. The doors have an intelligence that's supposed to have them appreciate their purpose and their meaning of their existence, and they they are almost mm-hmm. sexual about it. And they're like, and the door opens. The, the door is like, ah, it's open. <laughs> And we're happy to close the door. It like sighs when they open the door. And Marvin's like, these fuckers have it so easy. They know, they know why they exist and they know what they have to do and they have fulfilled their existence. What am I supposed to do? I know everything. I have solved all the problems and there is nothing else to do and it doesn't make any sense. Fuck me. And then they just pass the door. <laughs> this is just, yeah. Yeah. That, that was another part of the book that really didn't do it for me. Okay. Again, maybe probably just because I didn't like Marvin. <laughs> I was picturing you when I was thinking of Marvin because you're always like. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted you to read the line at the beginning because yeah, sometimes you have comments have... exactly like he would have, like when we talk about the books. It's like, okay. but not exactly. I mean, like, it could be. I don't know, but it's just like, just didn't find him interesting. Just, so just the depression, despair aspect of your <laughs> indulgence in despair. But you're right that he. It's very much about the cynicism and you're much more about the thinking and the realness, darkness of yeah. the story. So that's different. I'll give you that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the plot uh, goes to this planet. They want to find the secrets of the universe. And they go to this planet called Magratia or Magrafia. So what happens? Well, they get there and uh, essentially what happens is that they found the ruins of the planet creators hmm. and uh, they found that actually the mice on earth hmm. they were the people who commissioned earth uh, because they they needed like a planet to complete some huge quest mm-hmm. and the quest was to find the question of uh, life the universe and everything mm-hmm. because they had the answer and then there is the whole flashback about the answer mm-hmm. so that's uh, which yeah. Th- that's really like the single one thing where had I not known the answer, mm. maybe it would have been funnier. Like I can't really understand. I can't really imagine. Mm-hmm. So you, because I knew yeah. the answer. It was just like, ah, uh, yeah, it's the result is build up. I already know where this is yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joke to ruin the joke. Funny, so. <laughs> yeah. So to ruin the joke so, for you as well, if you never want to read this, uh, they make a computer yeah. to answer the question, what's the meaning of life? And it takes millennia yeah. and millennia and millennia and people yeah. keep like dying and there's generations and generations and finally the computer has the answer ready and they have this huge ceremony and the computer says, it's 42. Yeah. And the people are like, what the fuck, 42? And the computer is like, you'd better ask better questions next time, fuckers. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we should probably think about what we're asking. Which I love that this is exactly 
for people who want to know the meaning of life, this is exactly what you should be thinking about. Like, <laughs> I, I love it. It's, it's again just telling you something without being too preachy and also having a joke at mm-hmm. the same time. So it's like hitting all the things I want in a story because that's why I like it. Yeah. I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, it, it didn't really do for me. Mm. Like, yeah, anyway, let's let's not have... Uh, I'm just trying not to not to bore you because... Cause, no, 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 you're not boring <laughs> me. I know, it's I know, just, I'm just um... kidding. But I, I mean, <laughs> I, I keep thinking about, like, who is this podcast for? So I think we've done our job to tell people what this is if mm. they want to read it. And now people who are listening mm. now, they either read this and they're giant fans and they know all this. Or they don't care and they're gonna be bored if I talk about it. So I'm like, like, what, what am I saying here? Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Nobody's gonna be happy about it. So I'm just like, okay, let's just move on. And uh, so to have the question answered, like if you, so they have 42, but they don't know what's the question. So they they make a new computer, and the purpose of the computer is to come up with the question. So this is already stupid. Like <laughs> I was already laughing at this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why did they not learn from this? Like, okay, so they make Earth. They have this company or this uh, other race of aliens. They design mm-hmm. planets. So they design Earth, and there's this character called Slaut- Slartibard Fast, who is very proud of mm-hmm. making fjords in Norway, and yes. uh, he designed uh, the which Earth. made me think all the time about the maelstrom in the third book, like in that sense. <laughs> That's a weird reference. The whole time. So at yeah. least you found a free body problem reference and not a Dune reference. Yeah. But anyways, they design this planet and the people on it and all the life on Earth. And all this is supposed to have uh, compute the question, which makes complete sense from all the setup. People keep talking and stating the obvious. People keep o- overthinking stuff. People keep being unhappy. People keep doing bullshit. People have like nonsensical hobbies and like intentions and like uh, motivations. And none of this makes sense. Mm-hmm. And it's all designed to have people question life and reality and come up with the correct question, which is complete, <laughs> like uh, completely makes sense to me. While people are so stupid because they are designed to question everything and have stupid conversations <laughs> when they completely stumble above everything. They have no purpose and they just have to ask questions. And then they finally ask the right question. <laughs> and that's when they demolish Earth and it completely makes sense <laughs> so I love this <laughs> and uh, the the alien species who monitors this event or this experiment to come up with the question are mice so laboratory mice yeah. in Earth's laboratories uh, we thought we were experimenting on mice but little did we know that the mice were experimenting on us which is another point yes. I liked so yeah okay I'll, I'll just finish the story I guess <laughs> I mean, it is basically it is basically finished. Yeah. Like, yeah, I have like seven hundred just... more things to say, but <laughs> <laughs> no, you can say them. Well, anyway, they uh, come to this planet and they find out that all the population of this ancient planet of a super advanced civilization uh, mm. that designed planet Earth and uh, is like uh, having a business to construct planets. So they're all in hibernation. Do, do you know why? I forgot why. So they're staying in hibernation to wait out the economic recession. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was laughing so much. I was like, okay, the economy is bad. What are we going to do? Just hibernate. And when we wake up, it's going to be good. <laughs> so funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> Literally what people are doing. Yeah. Like right now, like there's a bunch of shit we shall not talk about in the world. And nobody's doing shit. Mm-hmm. Everybody's like, okay, let's wait this out. Economy is going to shit. Let's wait this out. And after we <laughs> waited long enough, it's going to be fine. I was like, you fuckers, what the hell? Like, that's exactly what this character is doing, what this, what this species is doing. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Earth has been demolished, and Arthur is the only person, or along with Trillian, who is a human, and they might still have some remnants of this question being made. So the two mice who are on this planet, they arrest and uh, want to uh, cut Arthur apart and pick his brain literally to find out the question that the earth was made for which i think this is kind of a plot hole that trillion is not important maybe they maybe they don't know trillion exists i don't know well they were living with trillion so <laughs> oh okay maybe she's a friend so they don't want to kill her okay <laughs> that's that's why so they try to get arthur but of course arthur doesn't want to die and 
At the same time, the police arrives because Zafot stole the ship, Heart of Gold, so they've been pursuing them to arrest, arrest him. Mm-hmm. So shit goes down, everybody's there's a mess. <laughs> and the mice are like, okay, we don't care anymore, but we have to uh, talk to our boss and our authorities and report what this question is. So so quickly, give us a question. That's anything question is fine, we don't care anymore. Just, just, just pretend it's the right question. He, he said, uh, how many roads does a man have to walk down? Ah, right. So apparently, to live a full life, if you have to walk down 42 roads that's Arthur's interpre- interpretation of this of this question yeah, Bob Dylan reference <laughs> okay well anyway the two mice they're like oh we don't care about any of this it's all fucked anyway so let's become TV stars and they be- they change their careers from scientists and they just become like a show entertainers and they just yeah. have a different job and the police just arrest everybody and it ends with uh, Marvin saving the day Mm-hmm. How does he save the day? Do you remember that part? Ah, uh, yeah, he does something to the police spaceship. Mm-hmm. So he connects to the space police spaceship, and that causes like they 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 don't have oxygen anymore mm-hmm. because the the spaceship just switches off and just basically dies. Do you remember why? Uh I think it commits suicide. Exactly, because yeah. while speaking to Marvin at the speed of light and. Show, Marvin showing her all the stuff he found out about life and the universe the ship yeah. completely agrees and understands that there is no arguing and there is no meaning in anything and there is no reason to exist so mm. it just switches off which <laughs> <laughs> is brilliant policemen die because their suit was connected oh, okay. to the spaceship in some way Yeah. and so when the, the spaceship turned off uh, they, yeah, they also died mm-hmm. so that leaves uh, our crew of characters Marvin, Zafod, uh, Ford, uh, Trillian, and Arthur. And they are like, okay, what the fuck are we doing now? And Zafod's like, ah, he's just have lunch at the end of the universe. And they fly to this yeah. special restaurant at the end of the universe. Where the universe is perpetually ending and starting again. So that's where the second book starts. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, I mean, that, that's literally the title of the mm-hmm. second book. Which I'm so confused. I always thought these two were one book because I had this book in many editions and they always included both. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know why they do that. <laughs> it's probably better. Like, I don't know. I only have the, the first one. Yeah. Well, so that's uh, that's the story. Uh, I have a lot of notes that I was like super excitedly remembering what I liked and stuff. But uh, I think I've talked enough. <laughs> is there any any other it's fine if there's anything else you I, want i'm happy that you you're willing to indulge me in raving about my favorite crap but uh <laughs> like i said there's no point like i can spoil you the jokes and if you know the jokes you're gonna be like ah i remember that it's fun and if you don't like if you know don't no, these I, jokes I, you're gonna be like i, I, I don't like care. the perspective you had i like the perspective you had on jokes like i didn't think too, too deep about any of them hmm. like you know whether like uh, the, the meaning of this is just that it's stupid to ask what's the meaning of life and everything mm-hmm. to me it was just like ah this is a joke because at the time the book came <laughs> out i think it was a trend that people kept asking this like you know how now people the trend is kind of like uh, the earth is like going to hell and we don't have enough like strength to come together and and fix Earth and and we wish aliens will come and fix shit or something. It's like the current like <laughs> current uh, like <laughs> fantasy <laughs> sci-fi <laughs> like uh, every, in everybody's mind. Uh, it's like global warming and yeah. war and hunger and overpopulation and all this crap and and we have to do something but nobody's doing anything and it's gonna be far in the future and gonna die and please aliens come and do something mm-hmm. new technology please now. It's like what now people are thinking. I feel like yeah. and in when this book came mm-hmm. out everybody was like okay the war finally ended and we have this like uh, we have uh, everybody's getting children and the economy is booming and the, the, everything's kind of fine and dandy uh, we can have all the stuff and american dream and all mm-hmm. this but what does it all mean why are we here oh, what mm-hmm. what's, i'm just gonna eat and die why and that's also the ending of the youtube's best video <laughs> yes which i already mentioned <laughs> yes, in the past about that. <laughs> So I think that's why this book started, because it's the ultimate answer to all this bullshit. Like, why am I here? What is the meaning of life? Uh, like, what, what the mm. fuck do you want me to say? Like, it doesn't make this question doesn't make sense. <laughs> and that's what this well, book says. Let me introduce you to the myth of Sisyphus. <laughs> okay. 
by Albert Camus. Do you know this book? Of course I know. You, you know it? I think so. Really? Sisyphus is okay. uh, the guy who pushes the rock infinitely up. Yes! Of course I know exactly. this. <laughs> It's like a most, one of the most famous... Explains why life is meaningless and yeah. like... <laughs> There's no point in anything. Mm-hmm. So could you, could you say what it was for people who don't know? So the myth of Sisyphus is the myth of this guy who has to push a rock on top of a hill every day. Mm-hmm. And then at night the rock goes down like a boulder. Mm-hmm. The, it rolls down and so the next day he has to push it up again. Mm-hmm. And that's his life. And so he starts thinking, hmm, maybe... Pushing up, up a hill every day <laughs> and then it goes down every night. It doesn't really make sense. Mm-hmm. Sh- so just... maybe my life doesn't make sense. It's a very good and connection. Everyone's life is like the life of Sisyphus. Mm-hmm. So. That's, that's perfect <laughs> from this that's book. That's book. exactly the joke because mm-hmm. so many people are doing this exact thing and complaining about it. Okay. Like so many people are in a spot in their life they don't like. And the only thing that's keeping them in debt is them. Mm. And that's exactly what this book is saying. Like, okay, at this time in the history of humankind, people were questioning, why are we here? Does it make sense for me to have a five, eight to five job and just, you know, shop, eat, shit, work, shop, eat, shit, work, movie? Like, what does this mean? Mm. What does this do? Like, why is this meaningful like should i just kill myself right now embrace nihilism and such mm-hmm. and th- this book is saying like okay but there is so much stuff to be happy about like look at all this script that we just went through on this adventure like none of this made sense mm-hmm. none of that has meaning but wasn't this so much fun isn't life amazing isn't like random stuff in the universe wonderful like you can have so uh, such a joyous life while embracing anything you want so just Like something, for God's sake. <laughs> Why is it that you hate everything? And and Marvin is exactly this answer. Marvin is like, fuck this. There is nothing. I know everything. And even if I studied for my whole life, I would just find out it doesn't mean anything. And this is just, just die. So, By the way, uh, I just realized that I have your Dune reference. Okay. Marvin is kind of like, kind of like warm later. Oh, okay. That's cool. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Good job. That's why that's my favorite Dune book so far. <laughs> it all makes sense though <laughs> yeah um, I mean if you put it that way like I, I think it makes a lot of sense I just couldn't read that deep into it I always read too deep I, into I, everything I, I, so, yeah. like I put the blame on myself not on the <laughs> not on the book I think you are completely right you went into it with okay I already know all this let's get it over with and then okay some of it was mm. fine I don't hate this uh, didn't hate wasn't great that's it mm. and uh I'm a person who loves to overthink and just think about stuff. Yeah, but usually I do the same. So I guess like the biggest fault of this book for me is just that it didn't spur any like deeper hmm. thought into me. I think, But yeah. again, maybe it's not the book's fault, it's my fault. Hmm. Like, I, don't know. I think this book is very important for our fathers because I hmm. think they literally went through this like psychological mental crisis in their life. Because they, they they had their families and they had their jobs and they were successful, they were accomplished, they were they had they have done what they should have done. Like, you know, they were told to start a family and be a man and own a house and have a stable life. But at the end of all that, they were like, and now what? And I think this book was their saving grace. They were like, Oh, and we can also have fun sometimes. And that's why they enjoy this book, because this is my father definitely. He was all his life mm-hmm. working so hard and trying to prove himself and have a legacy and mm-hmm. uh, do something meaningful. And this book was his escapism for it's okay to be fun, some, to have fun sometimes. Like they, they didn't have that. Like it was mm-hmm. a, a milestone in people's perception of life, I feel like, to, for them. That's why it was so popular. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, definitely, I guess for some people that, that was why like it was so successful because it was hitting on so many ways like on the jokes on the meaning on the like learning something about life and the universe like you actually learn some stuff about like how people think and work and how society is operating mm-hmm. and pointing out the issues so it, it hit on so many levels and you didn't have to care about any of them but if you found one of them that spoke to you you liked it and that's why this was super popular i think yeah i mean i still think that the reason why it was so popular mainly is the jokes were 
again that kind of like 70s 80s humor like mm-hmm. Monty Python, oh yeah, yeah that's which, also true well, it was really really popular uh, but I guess like th- that's the reason why it became popular but it's not the reason why it stuck mm. probably what you're saying is the reason why like it's still popular to this day mm. because I'm sure there are like 30 other books who were super popular in the 70s who now no one cares about because mm. like those jokes were fun at the time and now they're not fun anymore and yeah like they had no ulterior like meaning so yeah i would i would be ecstatic to transform this into the mind duck hitchhike hitchhike duck podcast <laughs> and have overthought over discussed every single point in this book because every time i find <laughs> new stuff but that's not why we are here i hope you've... Oh, you can do it <laughs> no no no, no, no. Just... that's definitely not why we're I'm here not sure. don't the... encourage me i'm qualified for that <laughs> Uh, so I would be severely underqualified. No, no, no. I just discuss uh, them. I don't think that's the point of any anybody's life and listening to any podcast. But uh, <laughs> I hope we've accomplished uh, what we set out to do, and that is to tell you what this is. I hope you have a good idea if you haven't read this. If you have read this, or if you haven't, and you mm-hmm. like, maybe oh, I wish I read this because it could have been funny, and now I have spoiled it. So I tell you. Just fuck it and don't read the first book and start with the restaurant at the end of the universe because we haven't spoiled it at all and people haven't spoiled many of these ideas. I think none of them. I was about to spoil some of them because I keep quoting them, but I haven't. So good for you, mm. <laughs> listeners. <laughs> and I would suggest this. I would suggest to our listeners and to Paolo, mm. give it a break. You know, you don't have to read it right now. And at some point where you want to read something light and something fun and just rest and have a have a joke on the train or like you're waiting and reading something for just like 20 minutes, pick up the restaurant at the end of the universe and read just one chapter and just put it mm-hmm. away and then read to something else. And you can like even read this in between books and have it as a break. And I think that would be the perfect thing to read this because as with this book, the plot lines are there and they have a point but it's more about yeah. the joke and the situation and the character and the point in the one story so you're telling me that i can either read this or the myth of sisyphus <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> that's not at all i say i mean it's about the same same number of pages so what i'm saying is try reading it a chapter at a time while you're bored somewhere or while you just want to have a laugh a little bit and i think it will work much better for you because you read it as every other book we are reading here. You read it as a storyline that mm. has to have a build-up point, uh, keep your interest, have a character arc. None of this is in this book. This book yeah. is uh, ponder about the universe and laugh a bit, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Of course, thank you for reading it. And that's where we're going to say goodbye. And, yeah. <laughs> 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 Any final words? <laughs> Does life make me make sense to you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. thank you. I'm happy you're not so deep in despair, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. See you in the next All episode. Right. <laughs> I promised at the beginning of this episode that I would explain all the tropes, and I forgot to mention the most massively useful thing that an interstellar hitchhiker can have that's the towel. This actually started as a joke because Douglas Adams was uh, notorious for always forgetting the towel when he went to the beach and his co-workers just poked fun at him. So that's why he initially included it in the book. And the explanation is simple. You can use a towel as a blanket, you can use it as a jacket, you can use it to dry stuff. I think at one point in the book you can use it to suck up nutritious fluid and then wring it in your mouth. So that's about the towel. Uh, After we have... uh, recorded this podcast and I have just edited it. I accidentally listened to an interview with Elon Musk and Elon Musk has pretty much the same opinion on the book. So at the end of this episode, I'd like to leave you with a clip with an opinion on this book by Elon Musk. Thank you very much for listening and uh, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and see you in the next episode where I'm super excited to talk about the newest book by Endeavour, Project Hail Mary. The two guests this time, Martin and Adam. What this is for, what this is, this whole thing. Yes, uh, I mean, I think the why, the why of things is very important. Um, I, I actually, uh, when I was, uh, I don't know, sort of t- young teens, uh, I, I got quite depressed about the meaning of life. Um, and I was trying to sort of understand the meaning of life 
looking at reading religious texts and, and reading books on philosophy. And I, I got into the German philosophers, which is definitely not wise if you're a young teenager, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> it can be a bit dark. Um, so, uh, much better read as an adult. Uh, um, and, and then, actually, I ended up reading um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but, and, which is actually a, a, a book on philosophy, just sort of disguised as a, as a silly humor book, but, but actually, a book, it's actually a fl- 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 philosophy book. And uh, Adams uh, makes the point that it, it's actually the, the, the question that is harder than the answer. Um, you know, he sort of makes a joke that the answer is 42. Um, that number does pop up a lot. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> even more important than the answer is the question. So that, that was the whole theme of that book. I mean, is that, is that, is that yes, basically so, how you see meaning then? That it's the pursuit yeah. so, so, of questions. Yeah, so I have a sort of... A, you know, a proposal for a, a worldview or a, motiva- a motivating philosophy, which is to understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. And the, the, to the degree that we expand the scope and scale of consciousness, uh, biological and digital, uh, we will be better able to, to uh, ask these, these questions, to frame these questions, and to understand why we're here, how we got here, what, what the heck is going on, and so that, that is my driving philosophy, is to expand the scope and scale of consciousness that we may better understand the nature of the universe. 